Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we just praise you for your grace and for your love. We praise you for the steadfastness of your love. And that through the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, we thank you for the access that we have to you. May the Holy Spirit take this time and speak to our hearts that our attention might be directed to things above, that teaching us in your word, that you might lead us into deeper truth and that as we know the truth of your word, we might walk in its light, rejoicing in Christ Jesus, looking ever to him, the author and the finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. I ask you to turn to Second Peter, the second epistle of Peter, chapter 3. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting, hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens beyond fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of Him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory, both now and forever. 
Amen. Since the beginning of Blessed Hope Forever in 2016, I have on occasion looked at the subject of Bible prophecy. I like to uh, jump over the kingdom age and look at the ultimate disposition of all these things which constitute the world system as we know it and look at the exhortations that are there for us by the Holy Spirit. I believe the reason the Holy Spirit gives us uh, this passage of Scripture is that it might uh, remind us a reminder that there will come in the last days scoffers who are going to laugh at the promise of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That, that's in no way a surprise. Uh, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to remind us, I believe, to excite our thinking uh, so that we don't find ourselves lined up with those who are the scoffers. Not that you're scoffing, but by your very life, you're joining with them and saying, where is the promise of His coming? The ultimate disposition of these things which we seem to love so dearly and, and cling are clinging on to so tenaciously is clearly outlined in this passage. The day of the Lord is going to come as a thief. Uh, your Bible says as a thief in the night. If you have the authorized version, uh, in the Greek it's not necessarily in the night, though, though it's inferred that this man steals in the darkness. Intrinsic in the word is the idea that here is a, an unexpected and an unknown visit. The passage is indicating to us that the appearance of the day of the Lord will come as a surprise to those who are in darkness and not in light in the day of the Lord. That is, that is the day of the Lord. That is the time, uh, period, period of time following the rapture uh, which extends all the way through probably to the new heavens and the new earth and perhaps beyond. The word day in the Greek means a period of time. Uh, it could be 24 hours or it could mark or denote a period of time, which I believe it, it does. It's not a 24-hour period, but a specific uh, era uh, the day of the Lord apparently begins at the, at the end of the times of the Gentiles, and by the time we reach this passage, it's uh, continued for a period of time, a thousand years plus. But the culmination of that period sees the heavens passing away with a rushing sound, and the Greek word there is the whistling of an arrow. I um, mean, if, if you've ever heard the whistle of an arrow go past you. It's kind of a like that. That's how it's going to end. The Greek shows us through that word that that's how it's going to sound. That the elements will be dissolved or let loose with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in it shall be burned up. Now, I think it's been of more than passing interest to Bible students over the years to try to picture this uh, this time. I think for many hundreds of years, possibly more, there's been a somehow in the consciousness of men the threat of the earth being burned up. Even before this passage of Scripture uh, was written under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, there were those who suggested that the day will come when the sun will It'll come close enough to the earth to burn it up. You know, there are even jokes told about this. You know, the, the student in, in high school raising his 
hand and saying, you know, uh, sir, did you say uh, the sun was going to come close enough to the earth to burn it up in 10 million years? And the teacher said, no, I said 100 million years. And the student said, well, I, I'm so relieved. I thought you said 10 million. And people have joked about it. And every once in a while, if there's a, a, a really hot summer, there appears an article someplace that this may be the foothills of an indication that the climate's going to get warmer and warmer until the earth and, and is burned up. And with the advent of nuclear energy and the understanding of the energies that exist in a transformation between mass and energy, it's been very popular to conclude that this is a beautiful picture written 2,000 years ago of fusion or, or of a, a nuclear reaction of energies that are emitted in the dissolution of matter, and that well may be it. In Colossians, we are told that by the Lord Jesus Christ, all things were created, and by Him they are held together. If you have the authorized version, it says, by Him all things consist. But the Greek says, by Him all things are forcibly held together. I don't know that this passage points directly to uh, nuclear physics as we know it today. Uh, surely it fits in this passage at this particular time in history. I am no expert in the field of physics. But uh, I do know that like charges repel and, and unlike charges attract the, the electron cloud that surrounds the nucleus uh, because of the charges present and the energies existing within the molecular structure or the atomic structure. Yet few scientists really ever ask why the nucleus doesn't fly apart when it's composed of the same ch charged particle. Like, like charges repel. Uh, uh, like charges held together in a densely packed nucleus in the atom. I believe that what the physicists may well wonder what holds everything together, which is to science a mystery, is, is our Lord Jesus Christ. Or He's the one that holds it together. I mean, how He does it is, well, it's just, I mean, why ask? I mean, you know, He's, He's all-powerful. Uh, he holds it together. and God doesn't need to make any particular divine change in creation for the elements to be let loose. Uh, in fact, the word is a very interesting one. This, this word is luo in the Greek and it's translated melt. I understand that some translations do translate it let loose and, and some translate it dissolve. Um, luo is a, is a Greek word meaning to loosen. In Colossians, we're told in the first chapter that Christ holds it all together and here He apparently lets it go. But you'll note in the seventh verse, the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are stored with fire. Now in the grammar, it's a perfect passive Somehow God prepared the first creation and He equipped it in such a way that it could be destroyed by water. Somehow or other, God stored the initial creation with enough water to destroy it. Now He comes along without explanation and in the simplest language, He tells me that this creation has been stored, perfect passive, that God previously perfectly stored it with fire and reserved it for fire they shall be let loose with intrinsic heat. Fervent heat in the 10th verse. It's the same word that the Greek medical student would use for a fever. It's intrinsic heat. It's indigenous heat. It's within the individual or the matter itself. It's interesting that the Greek word is one that speaks of internally generated heat. It isn't a blast furnace. It isn't a, a source of energy as, as gas or oil or some other combustible uh, material that we burn to provide heat you know, for the process, but it comes from within the process itself. And the translators 400 years ago translated it fervent heat 
It's intrinsic heat, internal heat. The earth also and the works that are in it shall be burned up. I think, I think the word that is most generally accepted here in the Greek is, is just what's been translated, burned up. Now, if whatever this thing is that God uses to hold the nucleus together, if it is let loose so that it flies apart, which it naturally wants to do, there would be the generation of an immense amount, amount of heat and a very quick transformation of present matter back to energy, which apparently is what it was, you know, how it existed before God pulled it together as matter in the creation. It's interesting that the language, first of all, tells us that Christ holds it together and that he made it. After he made it, he had to hold it together and that when he made it, he stored it with fire and he reserved that fire for the day of judgment. But I, don't, I do not think that it's for us to sit around wondering about how God is going to burn it up or why, but to look seriously at the message for us in verse 11. Uh, it says, since you know that all these things shall be dissolved, and that's, that's a better word than the word melt in verse 10. It's the same word. The word is luo again. Its root is luo. Seeing then that all these things shall be let loose, in which the heavens and the earth shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. That, that word melt is luo, to loose. You could translate it dissolved. Uh, be let loose. Seeing then that all these things shall be let loose or dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness in your manner of life and your attitude toward God. What kind of people ought we to be in our manner of living, our manner of life, and our attitude toward God? That's what the word godliness means. The word godliness, it does not mean living like God. It doesn't mean trying in your own way to be like God but in your attitude toward God so that it affects your thinking and your actions and your living. Not trying to be like God, but submitting yourself to Him. You know, and, and you know, guys got to stop and think, you know, what we ought to be doing is anticipating the 12th verse, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of the Lord. The word looking is the word awaiting uh, anxious, anxious, awaiting, waiting and watching uh, is is what it's saying. And we ought also uh, we should also pray and not faint. Watch therefore. Over and over again, the Lord Jesus Christ told us to watch. Now the warning of this chapter, the opening warning is that there will be scoffers who are not only watching, but who are scoffing at the promise of His coming. The warning is that the scoffer is going to scoff at the return of Christ. And folks, you'd be surprised at how many people who even profess to be Christian, you know, they like church, they, they, they like the love, they, they like the... The giving, they like the support, they like the music, they like the spirit, the fervor, the intensity that comes with knowing and loving the Lord Jesus Christ. So they align themselves with those kinds of people. But the thought of Jesus Christ personally returning to them is hilariously funny. They scoff at it. And the warning is not that you will be scoffers, but are in fact by your manner of living aligning yourself with the scoffer. I'm going to suggest that we need to get a grip on, on, on where our priorities are and, and what's important to us. And try to imagine, if you can, all of the things that you're working for. You know, just sort of take an inventory of your activity of your time, of your energy, of your drive, of your planning, your thinking, your, of the expenditure of your talent, all of those things are going to be burned up.
you know, maybe I'm being too blunt, but I'm not, I'm not suggesting that all, all the activities in your life that you, you're involved in, folks, are earthly. I'm not saying that at all. But I think that if an unprejudiced inventory were made of my life, I surely wouldn't set myself up as any example. It, it should be very clear to someone who doesn't know me and doesn't love me that my priorities are obviously earthbound, that my desires are obviously earthbound, that the great expenditure of my time and talent is earthbound. In fact, I would suggest that such an inventory made in my life would clearly indicate that I live in absolute contradiction to what I say I believe, and I have to look myself in the mirror and I have to say, you know, have I aligned myself with the scoffers? If you stop to realize that the very things that seem so precious, the very things for which we work so hard, and, and they seem so important, seeing all these things are going to be burned up. Shouldn't that make a fantastic difference in my manner of life and in my attitude toward God? Wherefore, verse 14, beloved, maybe, uh, maybe I should pause and just put a paragraph in here because of the ninth verse of the third chapters here. Surely the chapter is addressed to us. God is not slack concerning His promises to us, usward, not willing that any of us should perish, but that all of us should come to repentance. And of course we will because that's the will of God. If you have a uh, Schofield reference Bible that tells you uh, the word any there means all men, that's, that's not correct. You know, I, I don't know how you could possibly reach that conclusion from the context. And here we see the same thing. Verse 14, wherefore beloved, the this, this, this subject is not all men, it's beloved. The, the address of the chapter is not all men, it's to the beloved or beloved. And the revelation of the ninth verse is not the revelation of a defeated God, but is a statement of fact of the certainty of our position in the Lord Jesus Christ. My very relationship to God is based upon the will of God. It's a strong verse. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, and, and you see by the 14th verse, the Holy Spirit has concluded that you've come to grips with the truth that all of these things are going to be dissolved. And you now look for what? The coming of the day of God. That this is true that these things are going to be dissolved. Now in verse 14, the, the exhortation is, be diligent that you may be found by Him. If you have the author, again, if you have the authorized version, it's, it's that you may be found by Him in peace. In the closing scenes of the Gospel of John, you know, our Lord Jesus appeared to the disciples in the upper room, Peace I give unto you, uh, my peace uh, give I unto you. And then he spoke to them later and said he was leaving peace with them. And so there are two pieces in that passage of Scripture. There's the one he gave you, and then there's the one that he left with you. One of them, of course, the one he gave you is peace with God. If you, if you do not know that you have peace with God, you don't believe this book. Colossians chapter 1. Having therefore made peace by the blood of His cross. The, the peace that Christ gave you is the peace that He made for you. It's an established fact. You have peace with God. Therefore, beginning chapter 5 in the, in the book of Romans, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. If you don't know that peace, it's because you don't trust God. It's because you don't believe God. He not only gave you a peace, He left you a peace. And, and that's the one here. 
Is there in my life the tranquility and the rest and the peace that comes with this assurance? Or is there the unrest of unsatisfied desires, the lack of rest because I haven't reached my goals or whatever they might, that might be? When He comes back, will He find me resting and trusting in Him? That you may be found by Him First of all, in peace. Secondly, without spot. Third, blameless. Now it's interesting that God has, has already told us that judicially we, we are spotless and blameless and we stand before God without fault, without blame. But in the area of fellowship, it would seem to me if the Lord Jesus Christ came right now, most Christians are probably more actively engaged in things that intrigue and satisfy them than they are in diligently resting in Christ. In this same epistle, chapter 1, verse 3, I read in the most amazing statement. I, I Remember, the epistle is written to believers here. And in the third verse, I read that according as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. As His divine power has given unto us most things that pertain unto... No, all things that pertain unto life and godliness. By means of the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. Glory and virtue. Glory is our position in Christ. Virtue is our fellowship with Christ. You know, we, we rejoice abundantly in positional truth. We rejoice in the sovereignty of our God. We rejoice in the promise that there's no condemnation. There's no judgment for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. That's the glory. That's your judicial standing before God. But never does the Holy Spirit let us forget the virtue side the fellowship side. Dearly beloved, positional truth affects our condition. Dictates our condition. The fellowship side of the equation. You know, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. We don't conform to it. That's law. It, it transforms us because it's true. And grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In both Ephesians and Colossians, we're told in the most certain terms that God has absolutely judicially forgiven us all sins in Colossians, all trespasses in Ephesians. They are judicially forgiven. You're not under law. You'll never be judged under law. God says, Steve, I've given you all that you need for life and godliness. In the 14th verse, wherefore be diligent. In my diligence, it must be according to His divine power. Back in verse 3, never in my life am I, I going to win by my by diligence, if I, if I define diligence as, as I won't do that, I won't do that, oh God, I'll never do that again, you know, Lord, I promise you I won't do that again, that is not diligence. Obviously, the diligence to which I am being directed by the Holy Spirit is His divine power. I have all I need to be found by Him in peace, spotless and blameless. My diligence is centered in His divine power rather than in my strength. The chapter closes uh, at verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. Verse 18, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen seeing that you know these things ahead of time. Therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things ahead of time, beware lest also being led away with the error of the wicked, the error of the wicked, 
well, I know what the heir of the wicked is. They, they rob banks, they cheat on their income tax, they cheat on their wives, they break the, the speed limit, they murder, you know, whatever. But this book in the fourth verse of the first chapter, you have already escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust judicially. That is a finished transaction because of Christ. But the corruption is in the world there through lust. You know, the, the, the tenth commandment is thou shalt not covet. But if, if one thinks that, well, if you think that through, you know, one wouldn't break any of the commandments if you didn't covet. For that reason, when we're in the seventh chapter of Romans, the Holy Spirit has Paul declare that he would have he would not have known coveting but by the law, or if the law had not said thou shalt not covet, he'd have never have broken the law. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of coveting. And here I am in the first chapter. The, the corruption that is in the world is lust. The error of the wicked is coveting. It isn't stealing from banks. It isn't cheating on your wife. It isn't cheating on your income tax. The guy may be a high moral citizen in the community, but he covets more money, more position, more power, whatever it is. That's the error of the wicked. Not, not submission to God, but coveting, demanding what I want, spending my energy, my time, my effort, my strength to obtain what I want. Me first. Me, me, me. It's all about me. It's not I, but Christ. Less being led away with the error of the wicked. Not that you're going to go to hell, but, but the motivation behind those who are outside of Christ is coveting, and it's coveting that will take your eyes off the day of the Lord. Less being led away with the error of the wicked, you fall from your own steadfastness. Boy, there's an expression. Not that you fall from grace. Not that you lose eternal relationship with God. But that you fall from your own steadfastness. Moses fell. Solomon fell. David fell. Do we really know that all of, of these things shall be dissolved? They're all temporal, but what really counts is eternal in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think the error of the wicked here means falling into some sin. It means desire, coveting. It may be a desire for something that's perfectly good, but not Christ and not God. And that's the error of the wicked. Fall, fall from your own steadfastness. The, the contrast between setting my sights on something I want and to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's only one way I can do that, and that is yieldness to Him, feasting upon His Word, and if that isn't there, we can have, we can have a meltdown, our own melt, meltdown. We can, have our, we can have breakdowns. We can fall from our own steadfastness in so many ways. When we let the situations that, that surround us, you know, that all of that which which will be burned up, you know, the, the cars will be burned up, the houses will be burned up, the money will be burned up, the job will be burned up, your cat will be burned up. I, you know, I'm sorry, maybe I shouldn't have said that. A lot of you think your pets will be raptured, so I'm not going to go there. But the text seems to indicate an all-inclusive inclu uh, purge. All of the things, folks, that ob obsess our life today are temporal. And those very desires can lead us to fall from our own steadfastness. And the burden of the passage, the burden of the Holy Spirit to, is to center our attention on Christ and real, where we realize that God is in, He's not out of control. He does have a plan. There is a, a corruption in the world. And the basic drive behind that corruption is coveting or lusting, which is exactly what the law made very apparent in Romans chapter 7. Or to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen.
the Holy Spirit is telling you there in uh, the first chapter of this epistle that prophecy to you is made more sure because Christ was prophesied and Christ came, Christ died, and Christ rose. So, so you have prophecy made more sure. You have fulfilled prophecy and fulfilled prophecy is more certain than unfulfilled prophecy. And man, you've got a real anchor there. If you don't, if you don't know looking ahead that all these things shall be dissolved, if you don't know that all the elements will be let loose with fervent heat, and that all of these things that are so precious and dear to you will be done away and be burned up, if you don't know that you have the word of prophecy made more sure by the resurrection of Christ, that you have fulfilled prophecy behind you, it, it, it's the anchor of the soul. As you look forward to unfulfilled prophecy, we here at Blessed Hope Forever are praying for you all constantly. We ask for your prayers as well for the for God's directing uh, in this ministry. I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for all of your prayers, all of your 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 comments. I read every one. Until next time, rest in Him. Look unto Him as, as who He is, the author and the finisher of our faith. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.